Life Point Church, how you guys doing today? Come on, everybody. What a great morning. Can we just thank our worship team for an amazing job, especially, come on, that last song. Man, I mean, if you know, our world is changing, but our God stays the same. And because he is good and lives and faithful, we can, we can live and thrive and survive in this crazy world. Amen, everybody. Well, hey, uh, since you brought your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Psalm chapter 1. That's where we're going to be today. We're starting a brand new series in the book of Psalms. Hey, if you are new with us today or the first time joining us, whether online, live, or on demand, or if you're joining us in our lobby today, uh, wherever you're joining us from, welcome to Life Point. My name is Mike. I get to serve here as lead pastor of our church. If you are a guest with us, I want to invite you, if you would, please uh, grab your smartphone or text the letters LPC to the number 31996. And we just want to follow up with a simple next step, kind of welcome and a note from us to say welcome and some next steps for you, which all of our church, we believe uh, we are all in a process of taking next steps. By the way, I want to thank you for coming on Baptism Sunday. Come on, this is always a great day. Every month we start the month with baptisms. If you've never been baptized as a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you to uh, take, take the plunge today. This is the day to go public. That's really what it is. It's a public expression of what God is doing on the inside of you. And it is very powerful. It's a great moment for you. And, and we actually follow the scriptural pattern of believe and then be baptized. So maybe you've come from a tradition where you were dedicated or baptized or sprinkled as a baby or an infant. And I'm not going to take away from that ever, but I do want to encourage you to follow the Lord's pattern of baptism after belief in Jesus Christ. And so we have everything you need to be baptized today, whether it's in our next service or even after our third service. And hey, if you're watching online anywhere around the world, I had a friend from Brazil watching today. Come on, taking notes in Portuguese. She said so I could tell my family what the sermon was about. Wherever you are in the world, we want to help you with Baptism Sunday. And so if you'd like to be baptized today or this week, uh, just let us know in the chat feature and our campus pastor, our online campus pastor, Stephen Bailey, will give you the instructions and the next steps for you to be baptized today. Isn't it great, everybody? We want to baptize around the world today, Life Point. Come on. Don't work up your excitement too quick here, folks. Hey, um, I want to thank you for being a generous church, and uh, thank you for the last month. This series has been, was fun to preach, the Dollars and Cents series, and I want to encourage you uh, to stay faithful in your obedience to generosity, whether it's through tithing or giving beyond that, and uh, you can give online through our app. You can give by texting, and this is part of our expression of worship to the Lord. If you're at our Rossview location, you can actually, we have buckets or boxes, locked boxes out in the lobby, and a lot of you are mailing it in, and so thank you so much. This is part of our worship to the Lord that we provide for the work of ministry through our generosity, so thank you so much for that. Uh, but I, I do want to tell you, like, in the last four weeks, you know, we've done some knuckling in nuts and bolts. We've done some theological work about tithing and giving and stewardship and what that looks like. And then we, we ended the series with a, a, a really a message on kind of where's your heart with this? You know, what do you treasure? Do you treasure what the Lord treasures? And when we talk about tithing, this bringing the first 10th portion to the Lord, it's an offering of worship and adoration to God. It's always a sticking point for some folks who have never given that way before. And so we, we offer what we call this 90 day tithe challenge where we say, try it for 90 days. And if the Lord doesn't meet your needs, we'll refund it all back to you. And then we're going to meet and pray together. And we're going to talk together and see what happened. Well, uh, inevitably, we're, there's always somebody that takes this challenge. In fact, somebody mailed in their, their tie this week and they put on the envelope, 90-day challenge. And uh, so a lot of people take this challenge and hundreds over the years have done it. But we got this message last Sunday during the sermon, the final sermon on where is our heart when it comes to money. And Eric messaged in and he said, I tried the 90-day tithe challenge. I was going to prove Pastor Mike wrong. There's always one. You know what I'm saying? Like I, and that's me. I'm an eight on the Enneagram. I'm the obstinate one. I'm like, that doesn't work. I'm going to prove it. So he goes, I'm going to prove Pastor Mike wrong. And in less than three weeks, I got a raise and a promotion. Boom. God provides. <laughs> Take that, devil. And then Hannah is another one online in our online family. She messaged us and said, this series has been such a blessing to me in this month of this series. You remember the first week of the series, if you weren't here, if you were here, you remember we, we talked through some practical steps, get on a budget, get out of debt. And I taught the debt snowball, right? List your debts and all that. She said, this series has been such a blessing. I've used the debt snowball method and have paid off two of my debts, $6,500 in total. That's within a month. Isn't that crazy? And then she says, I've started tithing the full 10% which I've never done before. It was crazy scary, the amount of money to tithe, but God has provided through it all. Thank you so much for this series. So LifePoint, I just want to encourage you as you test the Lord. This is the only area 
that God says, put me to the test. He will prove faithful. Let that encourage all of you and however you give. Uh, trust the Lord that he's going to meet you on the other side of that. Amen, everyone. Come on. All right. Hey, uh, just so you know where we're headed, today we are starting a four-week series in the book of Psalms. Who's a Psalm reader? Anybody like the Psalms? Come on. Who's never heard of the book of Psalms? Okay, you don't have to. It's in the middle of your Bible, longest book of the Bible, and definitely a book that we should all be connected to, I think, as Christians. In fact, um, some people do a steady diet of reading through the Psalms every month. If you'll read, there's 150 Psalms in this book. If you'll read five a day, every month you'll read the whole book. And some of them are very short, like today's just six verses. The longest book, of course, of the Bible, Psalm 119, it's a kajillion verses. Um, but, but if you'll read every day, just five a day, uh, not only will it make a cool month, but I think over the course of a year, I'm telling you, you'll have a totally different perspective on worship, prayer, praise, even lament and anguish. 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 That's another word I'm making up. Even how to lament towards God. Anybody ever been upset and you just want to yell at God for a little bit? Oh, you liars. I know you have. Well, Psalm 13 is one of my favorite Psalms. David says to the Lord in, in the Psalm, he goes, how long, oh God, will you forget me? Forever? Man, I've prayed that prayer to God before, and I go, David said it first, don't, hit, don't mess with me. <laughs> I just want to encourage you, if you're not a student of the Psalms and the Proverbs, really, I want to encourage you to get a diet there. But we're going we're gonna to preach four Psalms over the next four weeks. And uh, I, my favorite way to preach is verse by verse through a passage of Scripture, which next month we're going to start the book of Acts for like at least a year, uh, going verse by verse. But, but this week we're starting with Psalm 1. It's a great start to a psalm series, right? Then we're going to jump, jump to the most famous doily psalm. All of your grandmothers have this doily in her kitchen with the Psalm 23. We're going to walk through Psalm 23 together. Psalm 73 uh, is a phenomenal message. And then we're going to end the series with Psalm 51. And we're going to learn how David responded to the Lord when he had a major failure. He messed up awfully bad, like probably worse than any of you have ever messed up before or failed. And David responds to God in Psalm 51. It is incredibly powerful. Then the next Sunday, first week of April is Easter, which I want to encourage everybody to invite someone. And we have these invite cards available for you in the lobby. We got seven services on the weekend at our Rossview location. Of course, we'll be online uh, and, and available all around the world. So I want to encourage everybody, get the link, get the, car, the QR code, or get the cards to invite folks. Okay, let's read Psalm 1 together. Grab your Bibles. Come on. And I'm going to encourage you to bring your Bible to church, even if you're tuning in somewhere around the world. Get a paper Bible with you. I'm old school like that. Come on. Psalm 1, blessed is the man, and this is blessed is the person, okay, the human, the person. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, who does not stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor will sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Lord, speak to us through the reading and the preaching and the hearing of your word today. May it change us forever. Amen. I love this opening psalm. Of the whole book of Psalms, I think David did such a great job opening with a psalm of blessing. It's like Jesus' first sermon. You remember the Sermon on the Mount? He starts with the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. There's an obvious desire from this psalm to distinguish life in God's blessing versus life in the path of wickedness. This is setting the tone really for the whole book of Psalms, that really there are only two options for how we live. If we're going to be binary about anything, let's be binary about our understanding. There's two ways to live. You're either living for God or you're living for you. You're either walking in God's will, way, and word and his blessings, or you're living out your way, your will, the culture's way, and it's ultimately destruction. In this dichotomy, there's light versus dark, blessing versus cursing, life versus death. That's the tone of the whole Bible. And there's a constant invitation that we would choose life, that we would choose blessing, that we would choose God's way over our own. Now, to be honest, I don't know anybody that looks forward to a life of destruction. Have you ever known somebody that their life's a wreck, right? Or they're just in a place in their life where things are just not going well. I've been a pastor a long time. 
And I can't tell you how many times I've walked with couples on the back end of an affair or divorce, or I've walked someone through rehab and taken them to a rehab center myself for drug addiction, alcohol addiction, or folks that have gone too far in certain areas of their life. And the place of destruction, I don't know anybody that sets out going, I can't wait for my life to fall apart. I've never been to a wedding where I'm doing the wedding and they've already planned how to destroy their marriage into divorce. And yet so many times, that's where we land. Nobody starts out deciding to be destroyed or deciding to walk in despair. But I think it's what happens when we don't consistently choose the path of life. Or we start making small choices that are misaligned from God's will. Or, or we just kick off a degree or two from, from alignment to God. And we think it's not a big deal. I can just compromise here or there. What's the harm? Nobody sees it. It's just, hey, I'm just, I'm just living my best life now. But destruction doesn't happen at once, does it? It's usually over the course of time when we realize we've gotten ourselves to a place that we didn't want to at first. This week I read the story of Korean Airlines Flight 007 from 1983, and some of you probably remember this. Korean Airlines was flying from New York to Seoul, Korea, and they had a stop in Anchorage, Alaska, and then a routine flight from Anchorage over to Seoul, over, up and over the Pacific Ocean, south of uh, Russia. But there was a slight error they found later in the navigation system internally that they didn't even see. It was in the computing system. There was a slight error in the navigation system that set the routing of the flight off by one and a half degree. And all of you aviators know how significant that is, not at first, but over the long haul, right? It's just one and a half degree. And at the point of departure, there was no noticeable difference. In fact, they took off the right one ray, runway and they were going the right direction, which is left. How do you get to Korea? Go left. <laughs> Anybody else think of the world as like a big right-left map, right? So they took off on the right runway, and they're going left. And even after 100 miles, they're still heading in the general right direction. But as they crossed over the Pacific, and they've now come over new airspace over land, they didn't realize, but they had found themselves in restricted Russian airspace. And this flight that was supposed to be much, much, much further in a different direction, but at one degree, 1.5 degrees off at the takeoff, ended up being considerably miles and miles and hundreds of miles in the wrong place when they crossed back over land. And the Russians scrambled fighter jets, intercepting the plane, thinking it was a U.S. spy plane. They shot it down out of the air. 270 people died instantly. Now, that story is tragic on many levels. But I think it can illustrate what happens to us if we're just not careful and making the right decisions and choosing the Lord carefully. We diverge a little here or there. We make compromises or we veer off course or we start listening to a new uh, influence or a new friend or we start, start acquiescing and believing the cultural transformations and the new changes of the day. We get out of church. Here's what happens. We get out of church for a couple weeks. And then before long, it's a, it's a couple months, and then, and then my kids have sports on the weekends, and so it's just little steps here and there, and it's well-intended. Nobody starts out with destruction, right? And we get out of rhythm, and then COVID happens, and, and one week turned into one month, turned into one year, and I, we're, we're out of rhythm, and we're just off. We, start, we stop reading his word. We stop engaging in prayer. We get out of the spiritual disciplines. We stop going to small group, committing and confessing and being accountable to others, and it's just one degree at a time. And we start getting close to people who aren't headed the same direction as our small group or our church family. And then we start embracing bitterness and unforgiveness. And we start believing that stuff. And we hold people accountable to things that they didn't mean to do to us. And it's not immediately felt, is it? Come on, it's not immediately felt. It's, it's six months later we go, yeah, I, I, I'm not that same. That's not me anymore. Or a year later we end up going, how did I get here? We're far from God. We're far from our values. We're far from our spouse. And it didn't happen instantly. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it's tragic. Sometimes it's, it's something. But, but if you really dig in, it's, it's just a degree or two off, way back in a, on a runway. I want us to spend the rest of this time slowly walking through this really practical psalm and walking through what it means to be consistent and walk in the blessing of God as he's described for us here and what that means we say no to and how we walk this out practically. This is considered, Psalm 1 is considered a wisdom psalm, which means that we should see it as a directive from the Lord. It's applicable to our daily lives. This isn't just theology or something we're to believe, but it's a way to behave as well. That's why it's a wisdom psalm. 
So I've titled this message, The Blessing. How many of you would say, I want my life to be blessed? Come on, just pretend, like, just pretend you're a hand raiser in church. <laughs> Come on, how many of you would say, I want my life to be blessed? Okay, I want to hold you accountable to that hand raise in just a minute. Nobody would say, no, keep your blessing away from me. Everybody wants to be blessed. The problem is we don't always understand what it is, first of all, and how do we get to be blessed? So I want to talk through that today. If we're going to understand how to be blessed, we've got to first understand what are the things that block the blessing? What blocked the blessing of God in our lives? Now, let's go through the verse slowly. Verse 1 says this, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Now, wicked is such a harsh word, right? Like it's almost offensive to hear, but, but wicked in the Bible is basically a category for anyone who doesn't belong to or behave with or follow the Lord, okay? So, so call it the unbeliever, the, the ungodly person or the, the wicked. I mean, it sounds really harsh, but it's the per- blessed is the person who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the person who doesn't stand in the way of sinners. Blessed is the person who doesn't sit in the seat of the scoffer. Now, let's focus in on that first word, blessed. The Hebrew word for blessed here is esher. Now, there's a couple different words in the Bible f- for blessed and blessing and, and different etymologies of those words and what they mean. But, but in this particular verse, the Hebrew word is esher. Everybody say esher. And this is a, a, a less frequently used Hebrew term in the scripture, um, about 45 times or so in the, in the Old Testament. But this word um, has to do not with anything material or the acquisition of stuff or influence or power or money, but this word blessed has to do with a centeredness. It's actually uh, interpreted in some translations as the word happy, but not happy like fake laughter happy. It's like I am, I'm content, I'm happy, I have a center. No matter what's happening around me, I have a centeredness and I have a happiness and a joy that comes from my devotion to God. Now listen, this word blessing, in, in our language, we look, at, we look at people who get stuff or become an influencer or have money or, or they're succeeding in their business and we say, look how blessed we are, right? Uh, some young entrepreneur rolls up in a sweet ride and we go, look at the Lord's blessing on your life. Or we help a small group member move into their dream home. Small group plug. We help a small group member move into their dream home. And we walk around their living room and their vaulted ceilings. And we're like, look at God's blessing on your life. And many of us have equated being blessed with having stuff. The rich young man in Luke 17, that was his problem. He, he saw the hand of God as the sign of God's blessing, yet he had this deep void of no intimacy with God. In fact, that's why he came to Jesus. He goes, what must I do to have eternal life? He was a rich young man, which means he was blessed. All of culture would say, look how blessed that young man is. And yet he was woefully far from God. He didn't have a contentment and a happiness and a settled centeredness in his walk with God. So he asked Jesus, what must I do to be blessed? And Jesus confronted him, well, your blessing has been your stuff and you need to find blessing in me. This is perhaps maybe the stuff you have is the sign of God's blessing, but this word for blessing, Esher, is more about a sense of happy contentment, a settled centeredness that's not based so much on what we have or how many people follow us or how big our influence is, but it's based on something so much richer. So let me ask you again, how many of you would say you would like to have this kind of blessing in your life, a happiness? a centeredness with God, a contentment that says no matter what craziness is going on out there, I belong to God, he belongs to me, and I'm satisfied in that. Anybody want that kind of blessing? Okay, here's what he says. David doesn't tell us what to do in order to be blessed. He starts with who not to be around. Now, isn't it interesting? If you come from any kind of charismatic background, come on, where are my charismatic folks at? Love that organ. Wish I was slaying more people in the spirit up in here. Come on. We've been taught for years, if you want to be blessed, do X, Y, and Z. Name this, claim this, blab this, grab this, confess this, get your faith right. You do you and you do these things and you'll be blessed. David doesn't start there. David starts with who not to be around. I find it really interesting that David's starting to be blessed has a lot to do with who he's walking with. Look what he says. Blessed is the person, happy and content and centered is the person who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, of the wicked, who doesn't stand in the way of the sinner, who doesn't, not in the way like, you're in my way, get out of my way. It's like in the flow of sinful people 
and who doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, that's really interesting verb language, but the stand, the walk, stand, and sit is basically doing life with. You ever watch the West Wing? Anybody remember the West Wing? Circa 1998. Come on, everybody. Back when mullets were cool. They were on the way out, but now they're coming back. Lord help us. Whatever it takes to get out of the skinny jeans phase, I embrace it. Remember on the West Wing, every scene was walking through a hallway, and they would walk, and they'd be like, sir, there's a big thing, there's a battle going on, they'd be walking, talking, walking, and then all of a sudden, when it got serious, they'd stand and talk in the hallway, remember that, by the windows, and then when it was really serious, let's go in my office and sit down. The idea of David, what he's doing here is he's actually building the progression of influence in your life. You're not going to just walk with these people. You're certainly not going to stand still with them and get into their flow, and you're not going to sit down and do life with them, is what he's saying. He says, if you want to have a centeredness and a peace and a contentment with your relationship with God, you must first check the people that you're doing life with. Sitting in the seat of scoffers, the ridiculers, the gossips, the critical folks, standing with sinners, those who are not walking with God, taking counsel and walking with the ungodly. He said, this is the way to make sure that you don't have blessing and peace. We want to be blessed like the Bible says, but how many of us walking with ungodly folks, standing with sinful people, sitting with gossips and critical folks? Listen, you think you don't do it? Listen, it's not only humans that we actually physically interact with. It's social media. It's every news network. Have you ever noticed when you watch the news, what do you do? We sit down and watch the news. And what is the news full of? Scoffing, gossip, criticism. We sit down and we engage this stuff and we wonder why we can't turn off the news with peace in our heart. Anybody ever notice you get done watching whatever your brand of national news and you're worked up and you're morale up and you're mad? You're either mad at Fauci or Fauci's critics. You're either mad at the president or the last president. You're, you're angry about something. What in the world's going on today? Because we sit in the, the seat with scoffing and criticism where we scroll it on our Instagram or our pages on our phone while we're sitting on the toilet. Many of us are losing our peace while we're losing our lunch. Come on, somebody. Oh, God, help us, Jesus. Hey. That's too far. It's probably too far. But the imagery will stick next time you're at. Listen, we do it with what we watch, the shows we engage. Are you kidding me? Some of the stuff that we put on our television, we're just walking with sinful counsel. We're just embracing this stuff. And we go, well, it's not real. It's just reality TV or it's just a movie. It's just made up or it's just the news. Hey, I got to be informed. Fine. But is it giving you the blessed life of contentment, happiness, and centeredness on the things of God? Can I tell you, 100% of the time when I'm in pastoral counseling, and I think our team can vouch for this, when we're walking people through the lack of peace and the junk of their lives, it's almost always connected to who they've been doing life with. If you want to be blessed and happy and content, I'm not talking about have stuff. I'm talking about having God and a centeredness in him. Listen, we got to get godless people and godless influences out of our lives. And you go, well, what about reaching people far from God? We got to be a witness. I'll get there. Hang on. Don't ever confuse being a witness with being watered down from them. Don't ever confuse, I'm trying to be a light into the darkness, but yet their darkness keeps permeating over you. If you ever find your relationship is compromising your centeredness, it's the wrong kind of relationship. From this passage, we see your blessing isn't being blocked by your lack of faith or your wrong confession. Come on, somebody. Somebody got set free just now. Perhaps your blessing is being blocked by your terrible friends and influences. Whether it's on the news, social media, television, the friends at your workplace, even bad influences in your family and friend group. I want to ask you this question then. Are you blessed? Are you happy, content, and centered in God? And if the answer is no, listen to me, everybody, listen. If the answer is no, don't blame God. Blame your Rolodex. How many of you don't know what a Rolodex is? (laughs) Lord, I thought when I wrote this sermon too, I was like, somebody, I'm going to lose them right there. If you're not walking in the blessing of God, don't blame God. Blame your friends list. Blame your contact list. Start evaluating that. Quit throwing shade on the Lord and start throwing shade on some friends that you've been hanging around too much. Don't get mad at God that you're not living in his peace and centeredness and his blessing. Get real about the friends that you're hanging out with. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, don't be deceived. Your company will change you. 
Evaluate your level of blessing and happiness and contentment, and then evaluate, am I walking with ungodly people? Am I standing in the seat of, uh, am I standing in the way of sinners? Am I sitting down with scornful and gossipy and critical people? Listen, I got nobody in my life. I'm telling you this is true. I've had to make decided decisions, and, and, and it can be any type of person. Listen, I have nobody in my life that's, that's influencing and moving me that doesn't want me to go where God wants me to go. I got nobody in my life that degrades my marriage or my relationship that talks smack or gossips or critics criticizes the calling of God on my life. I have nobody in my life like that because I want to walk in the centerness of God. I have tons of people that I'm trying to reach for Jesus. Let me be clear, but I got nobody in my life that's influencing me away from Jesus, away from the things that matter to me. Can I hear an amen? We all raised our hand. We said, I want to be blessed like this, but are you blocking it by the company you're keeping? It's interesting to me that David doesn't start with how to be blessed by doing certain things. Well, get your prayer life right. Read your Bible more. Go to church. That's coming, but he first says, if you're going to do that right, you got to get some folks out of your life. Same thing back with the rich young man, Jesus said. He goes, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said, what's the Bible say? He goes, honor your parents. Do all the commandments. He goes, okay. One thing you haven't done. And then he said, take everything you have and get rid of it and come follow me. He had to get rid of the blocker first before he could walk in the blessing of intimacy. And that's where some of us, we refuse to cut off bad relationships. But I'm telling you, if you want the blessed life, I'm not talking about stuff, I'm talking about centeredness. You gotta start by checking who's influencing you. Hey, some of us, we gotta turn the news off. Some of us need to delete social media or just unfriend a whole bunch of folks. We gotta manage what's influencing our lives. Can I hear an amen, everybody? So then what does it look like to be blessed by God? Notice he starts by saying, blessed is the man who doesn't walk with these folks. But this man is, look at this, but his delight, and it's his and her, okay? Please don't get upset about this. Verse 2, he says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, some of you are like, just Ten Commandments, memorize them? No, it's the way of God, the will of God, the words of God. The delight, listen, the delight of a blessed and centered person with God Our delight should be what delights God. Our delight should be what God says, what God's word says about things, what God's way is about things. We should be focused, look at this, on his law, on his word, on his way, he meditates day and night. Remember, this is the description of the blessed person. He doesn't walk with or stand with or sit with those who don't, we don't do life with ungodly people, but our delight, our love is not the right people, it's more time with the right God. Our passion, our focus, our hope, our delight is in God and our focus on him. This isn't just saying we love the Ten Commandments, but we delight in the ways of God. Our heart is for what God's heart is for. Our passions are for what God desires for us. The blessed person finds a happiness and a centeredness and a contentment because we delight in the things God is delighting. Listen, look what he says. And they meditate on the Lord day and night. Now, this is a fancy book word. You ready? Write this one down if you want. It's called a merism. And the Proverbs use merisms all the time. It's where you say the ends of a thing and you mean everything in between. So like I was working from dusk till dawn. Well, you worked all the way in between that too. Like I showed up at dusk and I clocked in and I clocked out at dawn. Well, the idea is that the polar extremes include everything in between. So here's what David is saying. The blessed person, the happy, content, and centered person It's thinking about the Lord all the time. Your delight is in God all the time. Your kids are being knuckleheads. Man, God help me raise these kids and not choke them. You're going to work and things are awesome and you got a promotion. Praise be to God, not to me. Praise be to the Lord. I'm meditating. You're working at a job that you hate. God, thank you for this job that I hate. I'm thankful, Lord, they pay me to come here and hate this job. Oh, bless God, I hate this job. Praise the Lord. It ain't been as bad as the cross of Calvary. Hallelujah. You know, like we are constantly meditating on the things of God. I've said this to you before. Listen, every heartbeat of your life matters to God. So how you spend every heartbeat of your life should matter to you. Now, I'll never forget in college walking through the parking lot next to my dorm and I had this moment. I was just praying. I was worshiping. I had my CD disc man in my backpack. Come on, somebody. Had the anti-skip feature. Come on, you remember that? When that came out, that was gold. Oh, yes, now I can run. That was short-lived. But anyway, and I had this moment in the parking lot. I was 19 years old, 
And I had this moment with the Lord. I was praying and walking to class. And I just felt like the Lord revealed to me. He's like, son, every part of your life matters to me. And I'm watching every moment. That's the blessed person who's centered. Man, come hell or high water, come craziness politically, come devastation socially, come tragedy with airlines and tsunamis and everything, but I'm centered on the fact that I'm constantly focused and meditating and my God is gonna walk me through this and I'm not alone. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I'm walking with God as a dad. I'm walking with God as a husband. I'm walking with God as a pastor. I'm walking with God when I'm in trouble. I'm walking with God when my world's falling apart. I'm meditating on the Lord. Every part of my life belongs to him. In the Old Testament, they would literally buy, take scripture and tie it to their hands so that every time they put their hand to something, they saw God's word. They would put little boxes of scripture on their foreheads so that everywhere they went, they could see this little box dangling on the top of their head, you know, and they just knew they had the word of God on their mind. They would put a scroll of the scripture. You go to Israel today and it's still that way. There's scrolls of scriptures on the doorpost of every house. And all of that is symbolic. It's not a requirement. It's a symbol to remind you that as I'm doing, I'm thinking of the Lord. As I'm walking, I'm thinking and meditating on the goodness of God. As I come into my home, as I leave my house, I've got the word of God on this place. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 through 7, Moses writes, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. And look what he says, teach them diligently to your children Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And the implication here is just talk about God all the time. You said, I want blessed life. It's going to be a matter of removing the, the influences that are blocking your blessing and start dwelling on the Lord. Here's what we've done in the American church. We've made our quiet time a category of our day. We've given 30 minutes to God, and we check that box, and then we go do work, and we go do drama, and we get back on Fox News or CNN, and we go catch up with what's happening in the world. But the blessed, centered, content, happy person, just think about the Lord all the, day, all the time. Now, it doesn't mean you're so spiritual you can't change a tire or, like, fly a plane. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't mean you're so spiritual that you can't make a sandwich for your kid's lunch. What it means is as you're flying, thank you, Lord. God, I'm worshiping you. I'm walking with you. I love that hymn we sang today, Because He Lives. It is worth the living just because he lives. How many of you know we live in a day that is stressful and it's worth living because he lives? And we can meditate on that and we can contemplate that all the time. So let me just ask you, do you consider the Lord often enough? And this isn't an obligation, it's an invite. It's, a, it's an offer from the Lord, like think of me, what, like c c consult me, Wonder about me because God is wondering about you all the time. Some of us, let me give you a really practical step. I don't know if you want to get scripture tattoos on your hand. I know that's popular in this church to get scriptures everywhere on you. My wife won't let me do it. She said my body's just perfect the way it is. <laughs> but maybe you want something on your wrist. Maybe you want something on your forehead. I would encourage you to put post-it notes everywhere your eyes land all day that say something like, dwell on the Lord, desire his goodness. Focus on Jesus when you're driving on Fort Campbell Boulevard. Bless the Lord. <laughs> Here's the description God gives us of this blessed life. So blessed is the person, happy and content, is the person who doesn't walk with ungodly people, but yet rather our delight is in the Lord and we think about him all the time. And then he says, that person is like a tree planted by strength. Notice the strength of this Description, he's like a tree, not a bush, and definitely not a Bradford pear tree, because come on, everybody, those trees are terrible. Like a mighty oak tree, planted, stuck, grounded by streams of water. And this imagery of streams of water, Jesus said, I am living water. You're planted by nourishment and provision in streams of water that yields your tree that's planted, that's planted by streams of water, your tree that yields its fruit. You will become fruitful. In the right season, look at this. You are fruitful in your season. Your leaf doesn't wither. In everything you do, you prosper. Now we start seeing what the blessed life looks like because I'm centered and I'm grounded and I'm content in that no matter what happens, I'm planted with God. I'm planted with him. I'm doing the life that God's called me to do. And in the right season, I'll bear fruit. One of our problems is we want fruit now. We want it now. We want it now. And we try something for three weeks and if it doesn't work, we go, ah, it doesn't work. How many of you know plants? Take a year or sometimes five years or 10 years, my favorite tree. Am I yelling? I feel like I'm yelling. 
My favorite tree is the magnolia because I'm from Louisiana. And it takes like 10 years for a magnolia tree to bloom its first flower. Man, some of us are so impatient. We go, okay, God, I gave you my heart. Now what? Got to go to that church. Fix it. Do it. Some of us just need to be planted and let yourself just get rooted in. How many of you know even in the winter, trees are growing down? How many of you know even in the fall time when the leaves are shedding, there's something about itself pruning and it's just getting better? And it's preparing for a season of fruitfulness. And some of you just need to wait a little longer and just stay planted a little further and just let the streams of the water of the word and the presence of God and the coming to church and being in a small group and doing the things where you're planted in the right way, let God bear fruit in your life in the right season. All of a sudden, he'll bring healing to that relationship. He'll bring joy to your job. He'll bring peace and, and, and love and grace in you. And you go, where in the world is this fruit coming from? It's because you found yourself planted in him and you're starting to live this blessed life. Look what he says, his leaf doesn't wither. I don't understand the concept of burning out. I don't understand the concept of burning out for God. I know what it's like to be tired. And I also know what it's like to be trying to be fruitful in a winter season. I know what that feels like. But I don't understand being planted with God and withering out. Because he said, you won't. And in everything you do, you'll prosper. Man, listen. Aren't these the people we look to for advice? Aren't these the folks that we start going, man, I need to get prayer. I need to get wisdom and advice from that person. Why? Because we see the fruitfulness of God in their lives. You know why they were fruitful? It's not because they're better than you. They just stayed more planted than you. It's maybe because they've gotten some of these junk relationships out of their lives and they've just chosen to delight in the Lord with all their hearts. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Man, it's an encouragement and a promise for you. Like a tree is a sign of strength and protection and you become protection and, and fruit for others. Strong and planted, you will be strong, planted in God's provision. Your leaf won't wither. Everything you'll do as you're centered in Christ, in your relationship with him, if you'll commit to delighting in the Lord, don't try to be perfect. Just connect to the one who is. Listen, you'll be fruitful. That's the blessed life is a fruitful life, centered on him. And then here's where he ends with this risk. And I think it's so apropos that David gives us this. It's kind of the way Jesus would teach. Remember in Revelation 2, he goes, if you don't, here's what's going to happen. But he said, not so, the wicked are not so, but they're like chaff that the wind drives away. Let me tell you something. If your life feels flippant and feels like you can't ever settle anywhere, you can't get things going in the right direction, it feels like everything is costing you everything, you got to consider again, are you living centered in Christ or are you influenced by wickedness and sinfulness? If your life is just constant chaos... That's not peace. He said, they're like chaff. The wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Man, notice the wicked are always inviting us to stand with them. But they will not stand in God's judgment. That is a day coming. I'm telling you, it's a day coming. I don't look forward to it for so many. That's why we preach the gospel. They will not stand in the day of judgment. They will not stand with sinners nor will sinners stand in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. It's like a risk he gives us. He's like, man, if you stay in that way, if you stay, it's that degree off right now. But if you stay there, the day of devastation may be coming your way. And, and, and you don't survive that. But this is what I love about God. He's so quick to say, just repent and turn back to me. I don't want to spend a lot of time here because this passage is pretty clear But this warning does not change no matter how much our culture changes, no matter how much standards of our world change, God's will, God's standard does not change. That reality should move us as Christians, by the way, to share the gospel. What do we do with people that we know that are wicked and not serving God? We promote the gospel to them. We don't allow them to influence us. We pray and we preach and we prophesy to them. Being a good person, a woke person, a tolerant and accepting of all things person is not being a blessed person whose delight is in the Lord day and night. And God will hold us all accountable. So here's where I want us to finish today. Y'all get anything out of this talk today? Y'all encouraged by Psalm 1? All right. So I know it's somewhat of a somber tone, but I want to give you this quickly, and then I'll close. I want you to think about what to do next. And here's, I'm going to leave it here. You can screenshot it, take a screenshot online, or you can take a photo with your camera if you're in the room. But I want you to consider the influences of your life. Are you walking, standing, and sitting with the wicked or not? Are you delighting in the Lord? Is your focus on the Lord all the time, day and night? 
Will you let the Lord plant you? Stop jumping churches because you're not growing fast enough. Quit jumping out of your small group. Quit quitting on God. Let the Lord plant you into some things and grow you and bear fruit in you in the right season. Will you start praying for those who are far from God? Will you just repent and turn your heart to the Lord? That's the only way to respond to a psalm like this, to a message like this. Amen, everybody. Let me pray for you. Pastor Bo will close us out and those online as well. Father, we love you. Thank you for Psalm 1. Thank you, Lord, that it is good for us, that, God, this is a living, breathing word for us, that it is changing us from the inside out. We hear it. We receive it. Let us marinate on it and change forever in Jesus' name. Everybody say, God, I'm all in. I believe in Jesus. I will live for him for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church.